Nintendo is home to some of the most cherished franchises in gaming history, but none of them are quite as unique and special as Mother. Beginning as an idea from the mind of Shigesato Itoi, pitched to Nintendo's very own Shigeru Miyamoto, it was presented as a different kind of RPG. One that would ditch the overused fantasy tropes in favor of a more modern feel that would poke fun at various aspects of Western culture. It was an idea that almost didn't come to be. Miyamoto's first impression wasn't what Itoi was hoping for, and he left the meeting feeling deflated. However, he was ultimately given the chance to bring his vision to life, on the condition that he would give the project his undivided attention. Shigesato Itoi was already a star in Japan. He's an actor, a writer, a copywriter, and someone who didn't know the first thing about game design when he started work on the first Mother game for the Famicom. Yet, as a result of the opportunity he was given, Mother is now a beloved IP with a passionate, devoted following of fans. It's an IP so beloved that it has inspired a multitude of budding game developers to create some truly creative works of art. It's led to fan games and translation projects fueled by dedication and love. And it's all because we gave Mother a chance. Maybe not right away, but over time more and more people have picked the games up and have realized that beneath the weirdness on the surface there exists memorable characters, timeless themes, humorous dialogue, imaginative worlds, and heart. It just goes to show that you can't judge a book by its cover. Sometimes it's worth it to go against your initial skepticism, because you might just find a gem. The Mother Trilogy is a gem that I am so happy I discovered. Like many people, I was first exposed to Mother through Super Smash Bros. Melee to be exact. Ness, the star of the second game, was a playable character. There were two stages based on locations from Earthbound, there were items from the games like the Mr. Saturn that broke opponents' shields, and when Brawl came out, Lucas, the main character of Mother 3, ended up being my main, despite not knowing who the hell he was or where he came from. Turns out he's from nowhere. It makes sense, I swear. Shortly after we got our first home computer, I was introduced to RPGs through Final Fantasy VII, emulation which offered a means of playing countless retro games that I had missed out on, and the internet, specifically YouTube and Chugga Conroy, back when Let's Plays were in their prime and you could say f as much as you wanted without the risk of your channel getting nuked. I owe this man a lot for giving me endless hours of entertainment, being one of the first creators to motivate me to eventually start my own YouTube channel, and most relevant to this video, I owe him for giving me a proper introduction to the Mother series. Just watching a few of his Earthbound videos got me interested enough to check it out for myself, and I stopped about an hour into it because I couldn't beat Frankie. So I stepped away for a while before eventually returning to the franchise, only this time, I jumped straight into Mother 3, and I didn't stop until I beat it. I'll save the details of my Mother 3 experience for when I get to that video, the gist of it is, Mother 3 made me the Mother fan. I am today. Now I've played all three games multiple times and I want to give the series the attention it deserves. I may not say nice things about everything, today's game in particular will make that readily apparent, but I have so much appreciation for this franchise that goes beyond the game's mechanics. And I want to share that with anyone who's willing to watch a couple more Mother videos. This is a Mother Retrospective. As previously stated, Shigesato Itoi didn't know the first thing about game development or programming when he pitched the idea for the first Mother game. But despite his busy schedule, he not only made several sacrifices to put as much focus as he could into the project, but one of his favorite things to do in his free time was play video games. RPGs like Dragon Quest were some of his favorites, and Mother was created from his desire to create an RPG that gamers would have an easier time getting personally attached to, one where it wouldn't be too far fetch for the player to imagine themselves as one of the main characters in the game's world. Although there's still plenty of fictional elements borrowed from the fantasy and sci-fi genres cause it's still a video game at the end of the day. And thus, development of Mother commenced. The title taken directly from a song that resonated with Itoi and even made him cry 
Mother by John Lennon. The title also played into the whole relatability factor that Itoi was trying to capture. Zelda and Dragon Quest both sound fantasy-like, Final Fantasy straight up has the word fantasy in its name. And then there's Mother, a common word used in everyday life that evokes thoughts of family. Itoi became CEO of the newly founded company Ape Inc., a studio that recruited novice game designers for their team. The final stretch of development was incredibly stressful, and Itoi began to grow impatient and just wanted to get it into the hands of consumers as quickly as possible. When Mother released in 1989 in Japan, it was ultimately released in an unfinished state, something I'm definitely going to bring up again later. Despite this, Mother's sales weren't affected as much as you'd expect. The game had some pretty unique marketing in the form of these clay models of the characters featured in promotional material on the game's manual. And there's also one of the greatest game commercials ever produced. Filmed in live action, showcasing the three main party members fighting a tall robot, which I think is supposed to be a Starman, but it might be one of these guys instead, I'm not entirely sure. The last shot of the party making their way toward Mount Itoi is my favorite part of the commercial. It feels so surreal. Real. Nintendo doesn't really adapt their IPs for other mediums anymore, and when they do, they get Chris Pratt to voice Mario. This advertisement made Mother feel like this big event that you couldn't miss. And it worked. Mother was a huge success in Japan and famously became the first RPG that Miyamoto played and completed. The man who was initially skeptical of the project, it's like poetry. Because of how huge the game was in Japan, Nintendo had high hopes that Mother would receive similar acclaim on the other side of the world, considering how the game focuses so much on Western society. Phil Sandhop spearheaded the localization process, but as many people know by now, Mother's English translation never ended up coming out for the NES. It came down to the fact that the console was on its way out, RPGs still weren't very popular in the West, and a battery pack for saving along with a strategy guide they planned on including with every copy would only increase the game's price. It's a good thing they learned their lesson. I get why Nintendo chose to shelve the game, but at the same time, I don't. The translation was done, the game was ready to go, they had even come up with a new name for it and everything, Earthbound. Joke's on them because it ended up leaking a few years later anyway. Somehow, a prototype cartridge of the translation got in the hands of the right people. The ROM ended up being dumped on the internet for everybody and their mother to download, but since Earthbound ended up being the official name of the English version of Mother 2, fans renamed Mother 1's English version as Earthbound 0 to differentiate the two. For the longest time, this was the only way you could play the NES version of Mother 1 in English, and unfortunately, this won't be the last time I'll be saying something like this. Eventually, Mother ended up being re-released as part of the Mother 1 Plus 2 game, a compilation of the first two installments ported to the Game Boy Advance, only in Japan. F off. If you want to try it out, there is a fan translation of this version by Clyde Mandolin, or as he's better known as on the internet, Tomato. And if the words fan translation turn you off, trust me, this guy's the real deal. He's great at what he does and has plenty of experience under his belt. I'll have a lot more to say about fan translations when I get to Mother 3. The GBA version is pretty faithful to the original, though the colors aren't all that accurate because it's on the Game Boy Advance, the music is watered down because it's on the Game Boy Advance, and there's some noticeable screen crunch because it's on the Game Boy Advance. Interesting to note though that some of the changes originally introduced in Earthbound Zero made their way into this port, such as the added run button, which is less of a run button and more of a fast forward feature that you'd find on emulators. All it does is speed up the game to give the illusion that you're moving quicker. It works, it just looks a little odd when you notice it. In November of 2014, fans released a ROM hack for Earthbound Zero titled Mother 25th Anniversary Edition, which aimed to fix many of the issues that plagued the original release to make it more accessible. I have more to say about this version later, but I really appreciate the amount of effort that went into this. Not only were game mechanics tweaked, but every sprite and environment was redrawn from scratch. I actually I actually have a soft spot for the visual style of the original. The artist based the character designs on the Peanuts cartoons, and it gives Mother a distinct look. The 25th anniversary edition has some high quality sprites though, and the amount of detail added to the overworld is crazy good. 
Thanks to the efforts of the community, there were now plenty of ways to play Mother 1, but there was still the moral concern of playing an unofficial ROM since Nintendo still hadn't made the game available outside of Japan. But signs were pointing to that changing very soon. Earthbound, the second game, and the only one that came out in the US back in 1994, was finally re-released as a virtual console title for the Wii U in 2014. And before we knew it, at E3 2015, Like, no joke, this was the highlight of that E3 for me, though admittedly there wasn't much competition. I still have the scars. More than anything, it got me excited at the possibility of Mother 3 getting an official release in the West as well. Maybe it'll be announced at next year's E3. I had just finished my freshman year of high school when Earthbound Beginnings was announced. I'm about to get my bachelor's degree and still no Mother 3. Earthbound Beginnings was nothing more than the English translation Nintendo had rotting away in their vault for the past 25 years. The very same one that was widely available online for over a decade. Heck, the title screen still says Earthbound. Regardless, this was an awesome release. Not awesome enough to warrant charging an extra $2 compared to every other NES game on the Wii U though, Nintendo. I did buy the game when it came out, but I didn't play it because I had already played Earthbound Zero on an emulator a few years back. Mother 1 was actually the last game in the trilogy that I played, right after I finished Earthbound, which was about a year after I finished Mother 3, I want to say. Here's a visual representation of my mother experience. I merely bought a beginning because I wanted to show my support. And I'm gonna say it, I don't like this name that much. I included it in the video title because it's the official name now, and I understand that they wanted to keep parody with the only other game that's released here, but eh, it's a bit of a mouthful. For the most part, I'll still be referring to it as Mother or Mother 1. If you want to play Earthbound Beginnings but don't want to wake the dead, it was added to the NES Online app on the Nintendo Switch a few months ago, and this is how I played the game for this video. I didn't want to go grave robbing but still wanted to highlight a version that most folks out there are likely to play. And I know this may sound shocking, but this is the version of the NES release I recommend people play if they don't want to emulate anything. Because if you're cool with emulation, Earthbound Zero is the exact same thing, and you get more benefits such as a speed up feature. I admire the work that was was put into the 25th anniversary edition, but in an attempt to rebalance the game, a new problem was created that, personally, bothers me just as much as the problems that were trying to be fixed. Again, I'll elaborate more on what I mean once I get into the review itself. So, Mother 1. What's it about? What's the grand narrative here that justifies that guaranteed masterpiece claim from the Japanese commercial? Well... I like it. That's a fucking lie. Yeah. Alright. Mother One's story isn't told very well. There isn't much in the way of character development and plot points are sloppily set up to the point where many players will probably be left puzzled by some things when they reach the end. And that will become clearer as I summarize the story. It's the early 1900s and aliens have invaded Earth. A young couple, George and Maria, are taken by the aliens. George returns safe and sound just a couple of years later, but Maria does not. Nobody ever sees her again, actually. Meanwhile, in secret, George studies psychic abilities known as PSI to understand their power. 80 years later, the player takes control of Ninten, our main protagonist and George's great-grandson. After performing an exorcism on a doll, as most young American boys do, Ninten gets a call from his dad telling him that he must set out on an adventure to master his PSI just because. Something about Ninten being his dad's only hope, but he doesn't explain any further. After saying goodbye to his two sisters and his mother, who could care less that her son is about to head into a world filled with freakishly large crows, suspicious hippies, and killer trucks? Ninten begins his quest. He soon winds up in Magicant, a strange world inhabited by mages and Sis? Ninten meets with Queen Mary, the ruler of Magicant, who asks him to find the eight melodies scattered across the land because she forgot the song and wants to hear it again. Yeah, apparently she also has amnesia and singing the eight melodies to her might jog her memory. Shortly after, Ninten meets and befriends a shy kid named Lloyd after bringing a rocket to him from the nearby factory which the boy tries setting off indoors. That was pretty funny. The two then meet a girl who also knows PSI by the name of Anna, and she tags along as well because Ninten gives her her hat back. And she wants to find her mom who's missing. After performing a dance routine in a club, the party beats up and recruits the leader of the town's blah blah gang who introduces himself as Teddy. Teddy learns that the kids are heading to Mount Toy next, which is where his parents died and he wants to avenge them. 
He dies an hour later. Okay, he doesn't die, he's just gravely injured after the party gets their asses kicked by this massive robot. Which happens right after this lovey-dovey dance Ninten and Anna have together after they confess their love for one another. Which has no build-up at all, might I add. I don't think they even know their last names. So Teddy has to stay behind to recover while the other three continue to climb the mountain. Ninten comes across a nice robot named Eve, left behind by his great-grandfather and programmed to protect Ninten. She dies for real about 10 minutes later though. At the top of Mount Itoi is the grave of Ninten's great-grandfather who speaks to the boy from the afterlife and teaches him the final melody. I haven't talked about the melodies much because they aren't as baked into your progression as they should be. In fact, most of what you do in the game feels unimportant to the plot. I've skipped over quite a lot of what you do in this game because it's simply not relevant. After your first visit to Magic Hand, things don't considerably pick up until you get to Mount Itoi, when the game is almost over. That's a pretty big gap that could have been filled with interactions between the main cast or more information about the alien threat that's causing the animals and some humans to go ape shit. But nope, we don't get any of that. So when you visit George's grave, there isn't much of an impact. What is Ninten feeling here? What is he thinking? Why doesn't he tell his dad how his journey is going when he calls him, you know, the guy that pushed him to start this adventure in the first place? Anyways, now that he knows the full song, Ninten returns to Magikant to sing it to Queen Mary. And upon hearing the melody, she gets her memory back. Queen Mary is Maria from the prologue, George's wife and Ninten's great-grandmother. Turns out that during her time with the aliens, she formed a bond with a youngling named Gygus and nurtured it as its mother. Yeah, it's Gygus, not Gabagul or however the f*** you're supposed to pronounce this. After remembering all this, Maria dies to join her husband George and Magikant disappears because it was all a part of her IMAGINATION Ninten, Anna, and Lloyd are transported back to Mount Itoi and they head to the summit where an alien mothership confronts them piloted by none other than Gygus himself, the big bad of the game who we just learned about a minute ago, and he's just now revealing himself. See what I mean when I say that things aren't properly set up here? Gygus explains that George stole vital information from his race, the study of PSI to be exact, and because of that he has a burning hatred for all of humanity. Ninten couldn't give a rat's ass though, he probably just wants to get back home and eat some homemade pizza and I don't blame him after the sh** he's gone through to get here. So he and the rest of the trio sing the 8 melodies to Gygus to flood his mind with memories of Maria, forcing him to retreat but not before swearing that he will one day return to get revenge. Some NPCs who were captured by the aliens throughout the course of the game like the adults of Youngtown are rescued, including Anna's mom. Lloyd returns to his school and is recognized as a hero by his peers. Anna goes back home and gets a letter from Ninten where he explains how he can't wait to see her again. Teddy recovers and leaves his gang behind to pursue a career as a singer, and Ninten is welcomed back home by his family and goes to sleep. There's a post credit scene where his dad calls to tell him about the Avengers Initiative. Alright, that's a lie, let's wrap it up. It's an NES plot, it's probably unfair of me to be overly critical about how painfully bare bones it is, but I felt nothing but indifference towards it during my first playthrough, and I'm just as indifferent to it now. It's so unseasoned, we learn next to nothing about the main characters as people aside from some extremely basic info. Lloyd is the nerd who gets picked on, Ninten is the protagonist and he meets a girl, guess that means they have to like each other. Teddy is a bit more interesting, but his wish to avenge his parents' deaths is forgotten about after he leaves the party. Why is Ninten's dad so hell-bent on sending his son on this quest? What exactly does he know about George and PSI and Gygus? Why is one of the eight melodies held by a f***ing cactus and why does to have such a beautiful singing voice. We got a number one victory royale. The closest the game gets to getting any kind of emotional response out of me is in the final battle, when you have to defeat Gygus by singing the eight melodies. And having played Earthbound and Mother 3's final bosses beforehand helps me appreciate the attempt at a heartfelt moment even more. It's not executed very well though, because the game leaves you with several unanswered questions. Claiming that Ninten is supposed to be a stand-in for the player doesn't excuse his wooden personality. The next game's protagonist is also meant to be a surrogate for the player, yet Ness exhibits traits that I can 
used to describe the kind of person he is. He has his own identity and I can still relate to him a great deal. The story is nothing to write home about, I think I've made that clear, but aside from Mother 3, storytelling is not the biggest reason why the Mother series is so highly regarded. The appeal comes from other things like the dialogue, setting, witty moments, music, etc. So in that respect, how well does Mother 1 hold up? Pretty well, actually. It's rough around the edges, of course, but I chalk that up mostly to hardware limitations. Though, I feel like I'm forgetting something. <sighs> Positives first, everyone. Mother's main gimmick is the time period and location it's set in, and its quirky sense of humor that's a staple of the franchise as a whole. Instead of being set in medieval times with mythical creatures, having to use golds to buy swords and shields and potions to face the monsters that await you, Mother 1 is set in 20th century America. The enemies you fight range from rats to elephants to deranged shoppers, with the occasional zombie, haunted suit of armor, and UFO every now and then. For combat, with the exception of Teddy who does use sharp weapons like swords and knives, you equip yourself with baseball bats, yo-yos, boomerangs, and literal bombs and bottle rocket explosives. Okay, not exactly everything here is something a kid could easily get their hands on. You buy your equipment at department stores. Nintendo's dad will deposit more money into your bank account to buy whatever you want as you get stronger. Thank god Nintendo's dad has so much money to spare, otherwise his son wouldn't be able to afford the ludicrously inflated prices of some of these items. Mother isn't just set in the US, it's an exaggerated version of the US and many of the laughs I had were due to how the country is depicted. Its economy, its citizens, the fact that you rest at hotels and heal up and visit hospitals to revive party members that fall in battle, which costs a crap ton of money. So if anything, I can say our healthcare system is portrayed accurately. Everyone in this world is like a caricature of the most extreme American stereotypes. There's the corrupt political figure who sends a minor to rescue a girl who's gone missing and then takes the credit for it. There's the careless residents dressed in blue in some towns who make no attempt to cover their coughs, resulting in you catching their illness. It's annoying in a gameplay sense, but a memorable detail. There's a janitor in Lloyd's Elementary School who who goes on and on about how naggy his wife is, he doesn't stop complaining about her, and if you agree with him, he scolds you for talking bad about his wife. This game is full of snarky NPCs like this. Mother is a series where I believe you owe it to yourself to go out of your way to talk to as many people as you can. The writing in the first game is the weakest in the trilogy, they were barely finding their footing, but there's still a handful of people here who will say things that will catch you completely off guard, either due to the sheer absurdity of what they say or because they'll straight up name drop the Game Boy and Super Mario Brothers, breaking the fourth wall as effortlessly as me avoiding talking about the parts of this game that make me want to tear my hair out. Snakes and other animals you fight to don't die they become quiet. There's a yeti who does the drip pose. Gang members are just silhouettes for some reason and they can curse at you to lower your stats. But you can eventually do the same to them when you find a book full of swear words. Yeah, eat shit, you fucking when your party members get knocked out, they don't disappear from your formation on the overworld. Instead, they're replaced by their ghosts, as if they're purposefully haunting you until you bring them back to life at the hospital. One of my favorite side characters is this pilot who lets you use his tank to travel across the desert after you pay him to ride his plane enough times. When you see him later, you have to pay for the damages after the tank gets wrecked, but he only charges you 200 bucks for some reason. This is the same country where a sports drink will set you back $75. This game is weird, and I love it for that. The story sadly did nothing to make me feel connected with the main cast, but at least I feel some kind of a connection to the world itself. You travel through a variety of different towns. You trek across a snowy mountain, you explore caves, you walk across a vast desert littered with landmines, one of them holding a secret message from Itoi himself. Oh, looks like I wasn't supposed to share that. You visit a swamp, a zoo, a haunted mansion, of course there's Magicant which is one of the few fantasy-like areas here, but because most of these places are rooted in reality and the way you get around ranges from traveling on foot to traveling by train, the journey that Mother 1 takes you on feels as if it was ripped straight out of the imagination of a kid who grew up in this kind of setting, which is just what Itoi was going for. There's something to admire about Mother 1's simplicity, and while I think Earthbound handles its world building way better, I don't agree with the notion that it's a replacement for the first game. These two games are different enough where I still find merit in revisiting both. Wanna know what else Mother 1 handles well? The music. These songs are iconic now, thanks in large part to Smash, but the NES compositions still sound excellent. A couple of you have probably picked up on this just from watching a few of my videos, but I freaking love video game music. 
A great soundtrack can raise a game's quality tremendously, and this goes double for RPGs from this era, when there was no voice acting and next to no sprite animation. Not every song is a winner, some can get kind of repetitive, but for every cave theme there's a dozen great ones like Mother Earth, Pollyanna, Being Friends, Snowman, Approaching Mount Itoi, Magicant, All I Ever Needed Was You, that last one being my personal favorite song in the game. The intro to one of the battle themes is even taken directly from the song Johnny B. Good by Chuck Berry. It's also in Earthbound, which is where I first heard it and when I did, I geeked the hell out. I had recently watched Back to the Future and loved that movie to death, so hearing my favorite song from that movie in a Nintendo game was quite a treat. Hirokazu Tanaka and Keiichi Suzuki worked on the soundtrack, the former having plenty of experience composing music for other Nintendo games, and the latter is one of the co-founders of the popular Japanese rock band Moonriders. Famously, the eight melodies have lyrics associated with them, and were sung by St. Paul's Cathedral Choir in that live-action commercial I brought up. Though what I think is a lesser-known fact is that some of the songs from the OST were included in a studio album, performed with live instruments and many of them also have lyrics. Catherine Warwick, Jeremy Budd, among other artists, provide the vocals in this album. It's a great listen, I recommend checking it out. The game's music is great, the graphics are another story. They could be better, could be worse. The sprite quality of the enemies when you're in battle is pretty good, but the overworld is where the visuals take a dip. It's cute, I'll give it that, though environments can look kind of samey, which makes navigation cumbersome, and don't even get me started on the dungeons. <sighs> It's time, isn't it? Not counting the story, I've been praising Mother 1 for the amount of personality it has for an NES game, but that ends here. Unfortunately, Mother 1 is an archaic, frustrating mess when you start paying attention to everything else. Let's start off lightly with the battle mechanics. Mother is a turn-based RPG series. Your party and your opponents will take turns attacking, defending, healing, what have you, until one side loses. This is one of the first big RPGs, so the combat is about as deep as a puddle of water. It takes a while before you start recruiting new party members and learning useful PSI moves, which are just this game's equivalent of magic spells found in other role-playing games. In the early hours, fights amount to nothing more than auto-battling until the enemy dies, or you die. Every now and then you'll heal of course to avoid getting a game over, but even when your party expands, battles never grow out of their mediocrity. Ninten is the most well-rounded party member. He's got good stats all around and can give enemies a good smack with a blunt object or use PSI to buff the party, weaken the enemy with different effects, or cure certain status ailments. Lloyd is absolutely useless. He doesn't have very good offense, his defense is worse than Ninten's, he's slow as butt so pretty much everybody will take their turn before he does, and he can't use PSI. Lloyd's gimmick is that he can use certain items like bottle rockets and ray guns to make up for his piss poor strength. But items like bottle rockets are gone after one use, and ray guns that do PK beam damage pack a punch but are extremely fragile as well. Most of the time, I just have Lloyd guard because he's not strong enough to keep up with the rest of the party, and having one of your characters die is extremely inconvenient because you have to rush to a hospital to revive them. Anna is going to be your main PSI user. She learns healing spells much quicker than Ninten, has more PP to boot, and has plenty of offensive PSI abilities at her disposal like PK Fire, Freeze, Thunder, and Beam. When you learn some of the later stages of these spells, Ana becomes an invaluable member of your team. PK Freeze Gamma puts one enemy in critical condition, PK Beam Gamma inflicts instant kill on one enemy, and PK Fire Omega inflicts instant kill on all enemies. Though chances are you won't learn that last one before you reach the final boss because of the high level requirement. Also, the game doesn't tell you what your PSI abilities do, so you have to either experiment and waste your precious PP or look up a chart online like I did. The catch with Anna is that her physical attack is terrible and so is her defense. She's a glass cannon essentially. Teddy is only in your group for about an hour of regular game time, but he rocks better stats than any of the younglings, and I mean way better stats. Like Lloyd, he can't use PSI, but his brute strength is more than enough to make up for it. Such a shame he has to leave so quickly. The battle system works, but it's not anything special. You aren't really encouraged to change up your strategy. Before long, you'll discover discover one that's effective and stick with it for the rest of the game. The best kind of turn-based combat is where you can't do the same thing for every single encounter. You have to learn enemy weaknesses, take your own weaknesses into account, and adapt based on your observations and what you learn in order to stay alive and be victorious. Mother is far from being the poster boy for turn-based combat, but you know what? 
I don't really mind that, and I'm not just saying that because it's an old RPG. Combat isn't this series' strong suit, just making that clear right now. The sequels introduce new mechanics that make the gameplay more interesting, but this isn't what I personally play the games for. So for that reason, even though it can obviously be improved, Mother 1 gets a pass. And aside from Albert Einstein Jr. over here, at least your party is capable of handling themselves against any opposition they'll face, right? Oh, so what's the other reason Mother 1 isn't very fun to play? Oh right, it's too f***ing hard. It's unfairly hard. It's one of the cruelest video games I've ever played. I died on my way to the first town on my first playthrough. I had beaten Earthbound, Mother 3, Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, and several other RPGs already, so it wasn't that I didn't know how these games worked. This game is just f***ing cheap like that. Where do I begin? Because there's a lot of things that contribute to this game's punishing difficulty aside from the enemies hitting hard and Jesus. Jesus Christ, do they hit hard. Okay, I know, let's begin with your inventory. You get 8 slots per character, and there's no way to increase the inventory's capacity, and at most you'll have 3 characters in your party at a time, making for a grand total of 24 slots. The game doesn't have any kind of separation in place for key and other important items, so things like your ATM card will always take up a slot, therefore reducing the total number of things you can carry. At the very least, equipment is taken out of your main inventory once equipped, and you can store items you don't need at the moment with your sister or one of the Magicant inhabitants, and the storage between the two is shared. Problem with this is that they're very out of the way. You do get the Onyx hook that can take you straight to Magicant from any area in the world to drop something off pick something up, or take advantage of Magic Hand's free hotel and hospital, but before you learn the teleport spell, which is missable I might add because you learn it by talking to this random baby in Youngtown, you have to go through the crystal cavern every single time you want to leave Magic Hand, and then you have to walk all the way back to wherever you were. And the map is less than ideal for keeping track of where you've been. Because of your limited inventory, you hardly have any room for healing items. Lloyd exclusive items like the bottle rockets drop in value so hard because I'd rather have items that can keep my team alive than items that don't do much damage and run out in the span of a few minutes anyways because I have never played another RPG with an encounter rate as obnoxious as the one in Mother. You're gonna be getting into battles constantly. Many times after taking only one step, you'll be pulled into another fight. Random encounters are already a common pet peeve. I've never really minded them as long as they aren't shoved down my throat every couple of seconds. Thankfully, Mother 1 doesn't do this. It's every couple of milliseconds. Like, oh my god, I'm just trying to get to the hotel to heal up. I'm just trying to get to the next town, knock it off with the encounter counters already. Imagine living in this world. What if you need to, I don't know, take a leak? Is that a f***ing car? I think this is an appropriate time to go into more detail regarding the 25th Anniversary Edition and also the GBA port while I'm at it. The 25th Anniversary Edition's approach to rebalancing Mother 1 involved reducing the rates at which you're stopped by a random encounter by a considerable amount. On paper, this seems like a good solution, but in practice, it creates a new dilemma. Now, trying to level up your party takes much longer because it's hard to simply find enemies to fight. Plus, battling is how you earn money, and if you want to keep your characters outfitted with the best gear possible at all times, you're gonna find yourself running out of cash faster than you ever would in the original version. Enemies supposedly reward you with more experience when you beat them, but I found it to not be enough. I have nothing against the folks who worked on this ROM hack. I just don't believe it's the end-all be-all version of the first Mother title. The NES and GBA releases may be hard as balls, but to some it might be worth dealing with them if it means you're able to comfortably afford everything you want to buy from the shops and not have to worry about being underleveled. Though let me assure you, there's no such thing as not being underleveled in Mother 1. Mother GBA not only keeps the uncensored content from the Japanese version, such as the cigarettes and the crow and blah blah gang member sprites, but exclusive to the fan translation is the easy ring item, and as the name implies, it's meant to make the game easier. I don't have much to say about this one though because I haven't played this version enough to form a full opinion, though from what I've read, some argue that the easy ring makes the game too easy. So I don't know, give it a shot if you're curious. Okay, back to losing my sh Let's go over the things unrelated to battles, so exploration, structure, dungeon design, and controls. Yes, controls. In an RPG, moving Ninten feels so stiff, it's so unresponsive. Everything has this big delay, making things that should be simple like menu navigation and going through doors a legitimate struggle. It doesn't help that the game has this roundabout way of checking objects and talking to NPCs. You're required to bring up this menu with the A button and select the talk command 
hand when you want to talk to somebody. Good luck though, because since everything is so delayed, the NPC will have probably moved before you can interact with them. And every now and then your screen can get cluttered with a bunch of these menus and text boxes. I mentioned earlier how I think towns can tend to blend in with each other, but that's nothing compared to how confusing navigation can be elsewhere. I wouldn't say it's as bad as Metroid 1, but Mother still has a pretty serious case of copy-paste syndrome. It's sometimes hard to tell where you've been or where you're going, and dungeons are designed in a maze-like fashion. And I'm not even going to try defending this in the slightest. Everything in these dungeons looks the damn same. There's no discernible landmarks, no map, I mean look at this. Pop quiz, which one's Sweet Little's Factory and which one's the Unknown Lab? They're both Duncan's Factory. How on earth are you supposed to beat this without some sort of guide? You're a liar if you say you did it, either that or you have way too much time on your hands. I'm sorry for getting hostile, that's not who I am, but what the f man, why is one of the melodies in a random ass cactus in the middle of dip sh nowhere? Mother 1, to a certain extent, is non-linear. You can beat the game by completing certain events in one order, while somebody else might beat it by doing things in a different order. I like non-linearity, I made a whole video series about how much I love it, but at the end of the day, your ultimate goal is to find the 8 melodies. And finding some of these can be so obtuse, so counterintuitive that, again, a guide is mandatory unless you enjoy aimlessly wandering around looking for them, which the game punishes you for anyway due to the encounter rate and difficulty to you. <laughs> We'll get to that in just a minute, sit tight now. There is an NPC in Magicant who gives you pretty direct hints concerning the whereabouts of each of the melodies, but even knowing where they are isn't enough sometimes. And he doesn't tell you these hints until after you reach the peak of Mounty Toy, by the way. The singing monkey only gives you his part of the song after you defeat the star man in the zoo. If you check the monkey's pen before that, nothing happens, and there's no indication that you'd have to check it again after beating the star man. This mother canary gives you her part of the song after you give her a canary chick, which can only be found in the top floor of Podunk's department store. Nobody tells you that. Pro tip, say no when the cashier offers to sell you the canary chick and he'll give it to you for free instead. This game would be vastly improved if the 8 melodies were just given to you naturally as you progress through the game. Maybe every time you beat a major boss. Reminds me of a game that's actually good. Instead, it becomes a game of finding 8 needles in a haystack if the haystack was filled with murderous aliens, animals, and robots that want to kick you in the dick. What the hell is this difficulty? Enemies do so much damage. You you will always be underleveled when you reach a new area, guarantee it. Meaning you have to do the thing that kills all the fun in an RPG, grinding. Ew! You have to grind so much in Mother 1 to stand a chance, even then, it's barely enough. Even with the high encounter rate, I must have spent no sh a third of my playtime walking in circles and getting into battles so that I could beat the game. My total playtime was 15 hours, in case you were wondering. It's not a very long RPG, and it'd be even less long if the game wasn't so unbalanced to the point where this is mandatory. Take my advice, grind at least a little whenever you're in Magic Hand, because you can heal in one of the houses at no cost, and because you're gonna want to buy the magic coin and the gold ring for each of your party members. This is the best defensive equipment in the entire entire game, and you're gonna need them as soon as possible. You might be able to afford them with the grinding you'll be required to do anyway when Lloyd and Anna join your party because they both start at level 1. But Teddy here starts at level 18. Why couldn't this apply to Lloyd and Anna? Does this game get a kick out of wasting my time? As if I don't have it hard enough with these enemies that can kill me in one hit out of nowhere with regular attacks, doubly so if they get a smash attack. At least it's not one-sided, your team can land smash attacks as well. But you know what else isn't one-sided? PK Beam Gamma. Yeah, that one hit kill spell Ana can learn, certain enemies have it too and it can only be avoided with the Franklin Badge, an item which there are only two of in the entire game. It will reflect PK Beam Gamma back towards the enemy. I was lucky enough to never have the Starman target anyone who didn't have the Franklin Badge on them in this playthrough, but god damn. Don't worry, these enemies will kick the crap out of you one way or another. Some can do continuous attacks, others will explode upon dying, forcing you to take unavoidable damage. And for the love of all that is holy, don't carry money with you if you don't need it. You'll lose half of it if you get a game over. Oh, and your PP doesn't get replenished when you hit continue, and Nintendo will be the only one who's conscious, meaning another exciting trip to the hospital. It's hard to fathom just how relentless this game can be without playing it yourself. 
Wanna know the best example of this game's bullshit? Look no further than Mounty Toy. My lord. No crying until the end? I'm crying now, f it's a difficulty spike like no other. Getting through the cave section is a chore, it's basically trial and error until you figure out the correct route. Then there's the plateau that's filled with titanians that can turn you to stone, and if all your party members are turned to stone, it's game over. You reach a rest area shortly after, but it's here where Teddy leaves the party due to his injuries from the encounter with the robot, and you're taken all the way back to the beginning, meaning you have to go through the caves and the plateau again, and this time with weak-ass Lloyd, who you'll likely have to level up more first if you want a shot at surviving. Things get much easier once you get Eve at least. She demolishes every enemy in your path, and thankfully, by the time she sacrifices herself to save the trio, you're almost at the end. As somebody who knows what to expect when I get to Mounty Toy, I know to prepare adequately. So here's some recommendations I have in case you ever want to put yourself through the torture. I grind a shit ton while I have Teddy and Eve with me since they make battles easier, especially Eve, though even then keeping these kids alive proves to be a pain. I make sure to stock up on as many life up creams as I can at the base of the mountain. This man has an unlimited supply of them and you'd be wise to take advantage of it. And since you'll likely have to run away from a majority of the encounters anyways, firstly, use Nintendo's 4th dimension slip to guarantee a successful escape, and secondly, here's a trick you can use to get to the peak safely. The teleport spell doesn't transport you to an area of your choice immediately. This is mother, and its quirkiness can be found in something as basic as fast travel. Before you can teleport, you're forced to run a certain distance, but if you run into something before you finish, you have to try again. Notice that this moves you through the overworld, and here's the kicker. Random encounters are deactivated during this. So, if you want to beat Mounty Toy without dealing with all the bullshit, abuse this trick like there's no tomorrow. Just please make sure you have something to run into or else you'll end up accidentally teleporting. I don't care if this is cheating, this area cheats too. Don't believe me? Think that people who complain about this part of the game are just exaggerating? Well, Itoi has revealed in interviews that because the team was rushing their work at the tail end of the game's development, Mount Itoi was not playtested. But he wasn't concerned if it turned out to be wildly difficult, which it is, because players could just grind more and eventually they'd reach a point where they're able to conquer it. Just... wow. This was another reason why I opted for playing the game on NSO for my review. Every time I've beaten Mother 1, I've had save states, fast forwarding to minimize the amount of time I spend grinding, something along those lines that made the process less irritating. The fast forward feature is the biggest thing I wanted to avoid being tempted towards using. I wanted the authentic Mother 1 experience of sitting through all the grinding in real time. It's horrible. I don't recommend it. Do I recommend Mother 1 itself though? No. Or I mean, yes? Uh, it's, it's complicated. Mother 1 falters as a game. It is riddled with rotten design choices and tainted by some of the worst difficulty balancing I've seen in any game, period. There's no getting around it, it is fundamentally flawed. However, I can't bring myself to hate it. At least, not anymore. When I started capturing footage of the game for this video, I was fully expecting to have almost nothing nice to say about it because I was so traumatized by my first playthrough. And the 25th anniversary edition, when I tried it out a couple of years ago, didn't do enough to fix my main gripes with the game. But as you've just watched, I wasn't entirely negative. It's that psychological thing where you're more likely to remember the bad aspects about something and if there's enough of them, they'll end up overshadowing the aspects you actually liked. By the time I finished the game again, I was shocked by how much I ended up chuckling at the writing and just how cozy the game's world was. I had always loved the music, and I love it even more now, same goes for the art style. And while I don't really like the story, my issues with it stem more from how it's presented and told in this game, rather than the premise itself. There is untapped potential here that I believe can make for a simple yet effective narrative and a great game in general. The original is not very good, but it's not irredeemable. A remake, however, and I'm talking about a full-blown remake, one that rebuilds everything from the ground up and fleshes out every little thing about the game, could put Mother 1 on the same level as Earthbound and Mother 3. 
And what do you know, one technically exists. Mother Encore is a fan game currently in the works that's setting out to do what I just described. It looks phenomenal, and if you're at all interested, please go look into it and support the devs by playing it when it comes out. I'll leave a link to the official website and the remix soundtrack in the description below. It's but one of the many, many fan projects that the Mother series has given life to. But as of now, Mother 1, Earthbound 0, Earthbound Beginnings, however you want to call it, it's flawed, but you'd be hard pressed to find another NES game like it. Anyways, we're just getting started folks, because next time we meet I'll be looking at the next entry in the Mother Trilogy, one that did come out in the US not long after it did in Japan, Mother 2, or how we on this side of the world know it as, Earthbound. Until then, be safe, take care, hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you for watching.